Good morning. My name is Stephanie. I, if I haven't gotten a chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. Um, just a couple of notes before as we begin worship, actually. Um, our pew pads, our furniture pads, are in the center aisle of the chairs, so if you would fill those out and then pass them to the outside, that would be great. Um, this way we can get your contact information. If you would like to know what's going on in the life of our church, uh, we would love to get you connected. Um, so you can fill that out. There are, If you are new or visiting, welcome. We're really glad you're here. Um, you can fill out one of the connect cards that's in the top of those pew pads, um, and you can just deposit that straight into the offering box after service so we can get you connected and um, we would love to be able to do so and then um, if there are any families with kiddos in here we are so glad that your kids are here with us in worship this morning um, we believe that kids belong with their families in worship um, that's how they learn to worship is by being with us and so um, if you have a little one who needs a little extra help um, in staying attentive we do have a red cart over here that they can grab something anytime um, there's coloring sheets visit toys all the things um, so please make use of that cart. With that, would you join me in prayer? Lord, you are good. It is an incredible gift that we are able to enter into your presence this morning to bring you glory and praise. So God, we ask that you um, would be what we focus on this morning. Would you take anything that may be distracting our hearts or our minds from you? And lay them at your feet so that we can glorify who you are and what you have done for us with your grace. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and join me in the call to worship this morning? <clears throat> Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Hey, good morning, church. You notice the uh, titles of the first two songs have the word great in them. How great is our God and great is our faithfulness. Because that's what we want to do this morning is to lift up how good our God is and how great that he is. So please join with us. Because we tell him how great he is. Oh, 
seated. As we prepare to forgive our sins, hear God's fourth commandment from Exodus 20. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in it, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Brothers and sisters, Please join me as we confess our sins and enter into the rest of forgiveness and grace. Let us pray the prayer on your screens or in your worship guide. Let us pray. Father, you say to observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but we have allowed this generous commandment to become a burden. 
We have vainly searched for true rest through worldly means rather than in your presence and promises. We have filled our Sabbaths with ordinary work, inordinate leisure, and sinful behavior instead of being renewed in the blessed rhythms of worship, fellowship, and acts of mercy. Our lack of rest has left us weary, worn, and vulnerable. God of rest, today we make the active choice to enter your rest and to join with you in delighting in this good world you have made and in the good word you have given. We choose to tune out all that robs our souls of life, and we tune into the enjoyment of you, who fills our souls with joy and reminds us that in Christ, we are your children. We now have the opportunity to bring our silent personal prayers of confession to the Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, would you hear this good news? Who among us has the power to condemn us? There's only one, and his name is Jesus. And instead of condemning, Jesus came and lived on behalf of us, died for our sake, and now prays for us and intercedes on our behalf to the Father. Because those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus, our sins have already been forgiven. For the old has gone away, and behold, the new has come. Thanks be to God. Amen? And it's because we are forgiven uh, by Christ, we have the peace of Christ. We are free um, from shame and guilt, and we can have peace. And it is our joy to share that peace with those around us. So would you stand and pass the peace of Christ to those around you this morning?
Father, what good news that is. Lord, truly, your grace is enough. And Lord, we don't have words to adequately praise and thank you for all that you have done to save our souls in Jesus Christ. And yet, Father, even there, your grace is enough for us. Lord, we're so thankful this morning as we gather. We're so thankful to be able to be with brothers and sisters and lift up our praise to you, Lord Christ Jesus. You are worthy and we magnify you. Lord, thank you for speaking to us, God. Thank you for leaving us your word. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your gospel. And Father, today as we come again to your word, God, we pray that you would nourish us, that you would feed us, that you would speak your truth into us, Lord. Father, uh, today we, we deal with um, some words that, of Jesus that are um, they're challenging for us. And so, Father, as we come to challenging words, Lord, we pray that we would not um, recoil, but, Lord, we would lean in to the truth that you have for us today. Lord, glorify your name in the preaching of your word and give us your truth. We pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. If you would remain standing for the reading of the word, uh, if you're uh, uh, new around here, we generally stand uh, for the reading of the scripture not because we have to, uh, it's not a, a duty, Uh, We do because we believe that this is the word of our king, and it's the most important thing that we will ever hear. And so we stand to attend to the reading of the word. And so today we are in Mark 2, 23 through 3, 6. Mark 2, 23 through 3, 6. Um, Before I read this, these are two accounts of something that Jesus does on the Sabbath. So two scenes of Jesus on the Sabbath, and one principle that runs through, one direct line, one principle that runs through. So maybe you can spot that as we go by. Here we go. Mark 2, 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the priest, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. And so we say, thanks be to God. You may be seated, and our children, preschool through about second grade, you are welcome to go with Miss Lynn to Children's Church where you guys will deal with this same scripture at your level. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our children. 
God, we thank you for their life and for their exuberance and for their childlike faith. Father, as they go, we pray that your same spirit who abides with us, that we may understand, would abide with them, that they may understand your truth today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there is a tradition that defines what it means to be a Jew. That tradition is called the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the primary observance that separates God's people, the Jews, from all the other peoples of the earth. That Sabbath observance, it identifies them as God's chosen people. There are other things, of course, but but it's the Sabbath that most strongly identifies them as God's people. The Sabbath um, is so central, and it goes back to the Ten Commandments that we heard Regina read for us before our confession, but it also goes all the way back, its basis in the order of creation. The fourth commandment is the longest of the Ten Commandments. We read that in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. And that commandment, the fourth commandment, it instructs God's people to stop, to abstain from every kind of labor since God himself rested on the seventh day of creation. God rested from all of his work. That commandment, as I said, is rooted not in the time of Moses who, uh, through whom God gave those commandments, but it goes all the way back to creation order itself. Sabbath is rooted in the order of creation and attests to the divine order of the universe. It's a rhythm. Six days you shall work, and then one day you set aside where you don't work. It's a Sabbath unto the Lord. Well, around this idea of Sabbath, because it's so central to their identity, but also so central in the order of creation, the Jews, through the centuries, began to take this amazing gift of God. I'm going to talk about Sabbath observance for what that means for us a little bit later, but, uh, but Sabbath is God's gift to humanity. Sabbath speaks rest. Sabbath speaks life. Sabbath is good for us. But through the centuries, the Jews, because it's so sacred, this observance, they began to draw lines around what you can and can't do, what you should or should not do on the Sabbath. And so all of this apparatus grew up around this this very good gift of God to the extent that Sabbath in the time of Jesus is so restrictive. Um, Here's a couple of of things. Uh, In my research this week, um, the Mishnah is a collection of it's an, it was an oral history. It's an oral law at the time of Jesus. It's an oral tradition. And the Mishnah, it's, it's teachings of the rabbis, uh, and, and a lot of it had to do with Sabbath and observing the laws. And then the Mishnah was put down in about the year 200. But then around the Mishnah, there was commentary on this oral tradition. So you have God's word, what God says, and then you have the oral tradition around that. And then you have the commentaries of the rabbis about the oral tradition, which is about the thing that God said. And so there's these concentric rings around this really good gift of God. And yet those concentric rings begin to close in on the people who are trying to observe it. Um, The Talmud describes the Sabbath as a holy ordinance to God. The Mishnah lists 39 classes of work, not types of work, but classes of work, um, that would profane the Sabbath. So things like plowing, can't do, hunting, 
can't do. Do that six days, not on the seventh day. Um, butchering was another one. That wasn't obvious to me, but I guess in the time of the Jews, uh, around the time of Christ, that's, that's obvious. But then there's other things that aren't as obvious that were considered work, and the people of God ought not to do them. Here's a couple. One of them, the tying or loosening of knots. There go the church shoes, right? The tying or loosening of knots. Don't do it on the Sabbath, it's work. How about this? Sewing more than one stitch into cloth. I don't know what one stitch is going to accomplish. I don't know anything about sewing, but I don't think that's very much. But you can't do two. So you got to do one if you got to do one. Um, the writing of more than one letter. Tough. Choose the person you want to write to. It's just one. Then tough nugs for everybody else, right? Um, these observances, they grew more and more and more stringent. And the rabbis, they asked, well, what is work? And what constitutes work? And, and what's this and what's that? Um, so here's one. If I were to right now fall off this stage, and if we were observant Jews in the time of Jesus, and I dislocated my shoulder when I hit the ground, y'all could come around and immobilize that, but you couldn't put it back in its socket. That's tomorrow. <laughs> now, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? Because if a, if a bone is, uh, is broken or a joint is out of joint, there's a considerable amount of pain. And you would think that you could act in a way not just to immobilize it, but actually to reset it. But that's not the case when it comes to the, the laws, the traditions that grew up around the Sabbath. And then here, here we have Jesus. Jesus walking in the grain fields on the Sabbath day. And Jesus, with his men, they are hungry, and they pluck the heads of grain on the fringe of the field, uh, on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees see him. They go, ah, 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 ah. See? Lawbreaker. We got him. In fact, if you look at uh, all of Mark chapter 2, and maybe you've caught on to this, Mark chapter 2, as Jesus reveals who he is, as Jesus teaches, as Jesus does what he always does, he's rubbing up against uh, the conventional religious leaders of the time. And there's controversy that's brewing, 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 getting more intense all the way through Mark chapter 2 into Mark chapter 3. And we see that uh, in this passage today. Well, Jesus, he is actually not doing something that's unlawful according to Scripture. Deuteronomy 23.25 says it is legal to pluck heads of grain. It would be illegal to use a sickle but it's legal to pluck heads of grain. So actually what Jesus is doing is lawful according to God's word, but it's unlawful according to the tradition that has grown up around God's word. And Jesus says to them in verse 25, he says, have you never read what David did? Now remember David, he's the greatest king of Israel. He's the one who some thought was going to be the Messiah. He's the one who came to deliver God's people from their enemies at that time, 1,200 years before Jesus. He says, have you, ever, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? He entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence. Now, the bread of the presence was 12 loaves of bread put out every Sabbath on the table, uh, on the altar, in, in God's place, and it was there for food for the priests. And only the priests. And actually, David, or Jesus makes that point. He says, it's not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And also gave it to those who were with him. That actually was unlawful for David to do that. But what's the point that Jesus is making? Jesus is making the point. There's, there's a principle, and then he makes a greater point. The principle is this. The sustaining of life trumps the letter of the law. Let me just say that again. This is what Jesus is appealing to. The principle of sustaining life trumps the letter of the law. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. So if you're going home and there's a pond on your way home and it says no swimming, 
and yet there's somebody in there who is drowning, what do you do? You don't go, ha, well, you broke the law, you're getting what's coming to you. Nobody would do that. If you can swim, you're diving in. You're, you're saving that person. Why? Because the principle of life is more important than the sign. It's more important than the, than the law, the principle of the law, the letter of the law. But there's something greater that's going on here. Jesus not only shares this principle, but he shares by comparing himself to David that he has authority as the king, as the Messiah over the law and over the Sabbath. Uh, This is the point that Jesus has been uh, laboring to make in all of Mark. That he's the great lover king. He's the Messiah. The law belongs to him. He spoke it. Sabbath belongs to him. He invented it. It belongs to him. And in fact, he says that in verses 27 and 28. And I, w- I want to sit here in these two verses because they're just central to the whole, the whole thing. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In fact, verse 28, in the Greek, it begins with Lord. Uh, It's emphatic. Uh, We could hear it like this. And who is Lord of the Sabbath? The Son of Man is. That's how Jesus says it. You see, Jesus rules the Sabbath because it belongs to him. That means that Jesus is Lord of the traditions related to the Sabbath. And that's actually the whole point of this whole passage. See, this passage isn't actually about the Sabbath itself, although at the end of the sermon I'll make some comments about Sabbath, because I think Sabbath's really important. But actually, this whole passage, it's about the lordship of Jesus over those things that we think are very centrally important, that may or may not be God's truth. See, what's happening here, I want us to see this. Jesus is directly challenging their expectations regarding their most treasured traditions. That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus isn't saying, don't keep the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, you got the Sabbath wrong. Sabbath is good. It's God's gift to you, but you're bound to it. Why? Because you've made all these rules, all these regulations, all these traditions, like barnacles on the hull of a ship, and it's slowed you down because all of this stuff is attached to it. See, I'm a traditional guy. Um, I wear this pin on my lapel um, every Sunday. You might have noticed that. I wear it uh, because I got this pin in third grade after taking communicants class, a 12-week communicants class. I remember that when I was in third grade. And the result of that was I could come to the table of the Lord with my family as a third grader after taking that class at my Presbyterian church where I grew up. And we were given these pins. And so I wear this pin as a reminder of my pastor, of my Sunday school teachers, of my parents, of all of the the people who poured into me as God was was growing me up and developed me into uh, the man that I am. I also wear it as a reminder of the obligation, obligation is probably not the right word, but I feel it, it's a burden, to do the same for others, to do the same for you. To, to, to be that leader and that pastor, just like the one that led me to the Lord. And so that's why I wear this. And I mean, that's kind of a traditional thing, right? I don't have to wear it, uh, but I like to wear it because it, it's that reminder to me. Um, here, here's a tradition that, um, that some of you, you may hold to. It's very common. Um, we, we're getting ready for Christmas and uh, can't wait for Christmas. It's going to be great. I've heard about the things that happen around here and the carriage parade. and all. We're still in all the firsts, guys, right? We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do it all, and I, I can't wait. Christmas is a, just such a wonderful time. 
Um, We read Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story, and then we watch the kids' pageant. And, um, or, or you can recount the children's story because you know it, right? Um, Mary is riding a donkey uh, into Bethlehem, and she's like nine months plus two days pregnant. She's actually in labor on the back of the, of the donkey, right? And, and poor, inept Joseph, he's not prepared at all. I don't know what his problem is, but he hasn't prepared. And so she's giving, I mean, come on. And, and so, he's, uh, so he's frantically knocking on doors in a town, which I guess he has relatives who live there, but nobody wants to let him in. And then there's this, this angry innkeeper, this, this dour person, right, who doesn't give him any space except in the barn. You, you guys know how this goes. You've never, you've never heard this before? I'm going to blow your mind. Luke chapter 2, around verse 6, it says, of Bethlehem, of Joseph and Mary, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth to her firstborn son. while they were there. They're already there. No water breaking on the back of a donkey. They're there. Now, what what does that do to your your imagination of the tradition around the birth of Jesus? Maybe you're just like, oh my gosh, you just destroyed it for me. No, 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 no. Lean into God's word. God's word is awesome. There's an amazing thing there. But but here's, here's why I raise that. Do you know where all that comes from, all that tradition? Some monk in the Middle Ages wrote a novella about what he thought the birth of Jesus was like. And a lot of it stuck. And a lot of it became barnacles on the hull of our ship of the Word of God. And so now we read Luke chapter 2, we watch the kids' pageant with the, you know, the bathrobes and the, and the whole thing on the back of the donkey, and we think it's the same thing, but it's not. Traditions grow up that we think are sacred, but they might not necessarily be what God has for us. Here's another tradition. Um, Two weeks ago, we were blessed to all be together in this room and we had communion together. And in this service, we usually come forward uh, to the table of the Lord and receive communion. At the first service, we pass the, the, um, the trays of the elements one to another at, at communion. And here's the thing about communion. Why do we sit and pass trays? Some of you might be in this service and you wish that we would sit and pass trays because that's what you were raised on. That's what I was raised on as well. And you might think that that's a better mode than coming forward to receive communion. Well, here's how we get that. The Scots, Scottish Presbyterians, back during the Reformation times, 1500s, 1600s, they began a thing called holy fairs, F-A-I-R, like a country fair, okay? Holy fairs. It was a revival. They were four days long. People would come, they would stop work, they would, they would not go to school, they'd all come, and those Scot, the crazy Scots, right, they'd be outside. So they didn't meet in their church buildings, they met out in fields, they met under trees, they met under stars, and they had this revival, this four-day revival, and people would, the pastors would come and they would preach, and there would be repentance, and there would be uh, reconciliation, and there would be all these things, and it would lead up to the celebration of the Lord's Supper on the last day. And those Scots, what would they do? They would bring tables and chairs out from their churches, out under the trees, out under the stars, and they would sit in family units and church family groups around that, and they would serve each other the elements of the Lord's table. And it, they were wonderful. People came to faith in Jesus. Uh, revival broke out at various times all through Scotland, but here's the deal. Those pastors and those people wanted to retain the life-giving um, movement of the Holy Spirit during those revival times. And so you know what they started doing at communion? They started sitting and passing the trays as if they were around tables at the Holy Fairs. Do you know that became a tradition in Presbyterianism? And we have the trays to prove it? I love the trays, but I'm just, I'm just saying, that's what traditions do. I love traditions. I'm a traditional guy, but that's what traditionals do. That's what traditions do. Do you know what's an older tradition? 
coming forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Why, why do I say this? I say it because of this. Traditions are wonderful. They shape us. The traditions of LPC, it, it shapes us. It informs who we are. It's ways that we choose to live one with another. Uh, traditions in your life, around your faith, they shape you and they're important. This, this pen is important to me. It sh- it, what, what it symbolizes is things that shaped me. Traditions, however, if we're not careful, they also can start to bind us. To bind us. When we unhitch the thing from the thing it means, it can become empty and rote and hard and cold. And that's exactly what Jesus is speaking against in this passage when it comes to Sabbath observance. What good and gracious things has God given to you to enjoy but maybe have become for you stringent rules that bind you and threaten to rob you of joy that was the Sabbath for the Jews what is it for you Can you play something? What would happen if you saw Jesus as the Lord over even your tradition? You know what would happen? He would fill it with life. He would fill you with life as we bowed the knee to him. So the first thing I want us to see is here in verse 28, Jesus says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. It belongs to me. And I fill it with myself. And I fill it with life. Again, hear me. There's nothing wrong with traditions. Love them. There's something wrong when our traditions bind us or we bind others by them. Then we've lost the gospel. The second thing here, and I would be remiss to say this, um, is Sabbath is God's good gift to us. I I said this passage isn't primarily about Sabbath, but I would be remiss if I didn't say anything about Sabbath. So Sabbath serves us to give rest and healing to us. And Jesus is very clear We don't serve the Sabbath. We're not bound by Sabbath observance. And and praise God, we are under the new covenant. uh, Did anybody have Sabbath yesterday? Uh, We had about 50 women at a glorious, wonderful retreat. I guess you could count that as Sabbath. but, but, But I would say probably none of us thought about on a Saturday that it was Sabbath. We we don't worship on the Sabbath. We worship today. Today's the first day of the week. You know why we worship today? Who knows why we worship today on the first day of the week? Thank you. Brad knows something. You know why? Jesus rose from the dead today. That's why we worship. That's why Christians worship on Sunday, on the first day of the week, instead of the Sabbath. That's the seventh day of the week when God rested. No, we we worship today. Because Jesus rose, Jesus worked, and Jesus conquered, and that's why we worship today. Um, Here's the thing. For all of us who are in Christ, the New Testament is very clear. Sabbath isn't a day. Sabbath, for us, I mean, you can take a 24-hour period, and that's a great rhythm in your life, but you're not bound to do that. Sabbath isn't a day. Sabbath isn't a period of time. Sabbath isn't uh, your, your devotional time. It can be all of those things, but you're not bound by them. Here's the thing. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. 
Why? Because Jesus, by his death and resurrection and ascension and his work in our lives to to forgive and to heal and to restore us, he's given us rest from our labors of sin. And he has given us life in his name. So Jesus is now our Sabbath rest. That's what the book of Hebrews declares in Hebrews 3 and 4. Sabbath, it was given as a gift for our spiritual and physical refreshment. You know, when you, um, when we take a break, you can't work all the time. We need to rest. Rest is good for us. It's God's plan for us. And did you know that when we rest, when you choose to rest in a Sabbath kind of way, that's an action of faith. Because in resting, we declare, God doesn't need my help in getting everything done. God doesn't need my help in getting anything done. I can, I can rest. And you know what? It'll be there tomorrow. And I can take it back up again. Sabbath creates space for rest, for recreation, for relationships, for fellowship, for enjoyment of life. That's the point of Sabbath to enjoy the world that God has made and to enjoy one another. Sabbath. It's a good gift of God. It really is. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus gives rest to the man with the withered hand in the second part of the Uh, Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all six verses. I'm done. Jesus gives rest to that man with the withered hand in the action of healing. Having a withered hand at that time, that's, that's work, that's labor, that's burden, that's binding. And Jesus sets him free. And notice, Jesus sets him free with a word. He doesn't lift a finger. He doesn't do any work. He just says, stretch out your hand. It's restored. Jesus gives rest to that man. And he gives rest to you. He gives rest to me in the act of forgiving. The unforgiven, the Pharisees, they can't see it. They they can't know his rest. And and in wonderful Markan irony, did you notice the last verse of what I read? They go from watching him to being silent and grumbling to plotting his death. Guys, we're only in Mark chapter 3, and they're all already plotting his death on the Sabbath. Now, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure there must be some kind of rabbinic teaching saying, you plot a guy's death, you can't do that on the Sabbath. I'm sure that's somewhere. You see the irony? He has come to set free, to give healing, to give life, and they're plotting evil and death. They're breaking their own commandment, and they can't even see it. As Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus beckons us to lay down our burdens and take up his yoke, which is easy, and his burden, which is light. He is our rest. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Jesus, um, we thank you that you are so much more ready to give than we are to ask. Lord, you are life, and you are rest for us, for our labors. Holy Spirit, would you minister your peace among us today? Some of us uh, might be striving in our souls right now, and I pray, Lord, that we would find rest in you, knowing that you are the God who, who holds us. You are the God who gives us rest in Christ. Lord, I pray that you would fill us today with life. Praise you, Lord, that you are Lord of all. You are Lord of the Sabbath. You are Lord of our lives. You are Lord of all. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we respond with a song called, He Will Hold Me Fast. Because as we ponder about resting in Christ, how much more can we understand that we can rest in him because he's holding us.
seated and Monty would you come and share with us about our feeding ministry ministry of hospitality thanks brother Thank you. morning church <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know who I am I am the my name is Monty Wiederhold I am the feeding ministry coordinator uh, and I want to take a moment to thank those that are here in the service that do work in our feeding ministry really appreciate uh, those that are involved in that. And I want to share some scripture with you that, you know, Hebrews chapter 13 talks about brotherly love and servantship and that. Um, Hebrews 13, 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but to do good and communicate, forget not for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So, you know, God, while we're serving our fellow church members or those in our community, God is pleased with that. He's taken note of that. Uh, and you know, sometimes maybe you think, well, we're just feeding these people and they come and go or whatever. Let me give you a couple of stories that shows that it goes way more beyond that. Um, in the spring of 24, one of our guests approached us about a need. Her two small grandchildren were living with her and she was in a desperate need of a crib. She also mentioned her granddaughter was being evaluated for autism and she was in need of uh, support. Through our contact in the church, we were able to not only provide a crib, but all of the bedding and toys, including many, many sensory appropriate ones. Perhaps the biggest blessing though was from that, the granddaughter is now enrolled in LPC uh, Play School. And it goes to show that the encounter had nothing to do with food, but everything to do with our church and our ministry, our outreach, um, being the hands and feet of Christ in our community. Uh, one of the times Charlotte and I were at the drive-thru in Arby's 
uh, some time ago, a young lady said to Char, said, I, you look familiar. And Charlotte said, I, I attend LPC. He said, maybe you saw me there. She goes, well, I don't go there, but said, I remember you guys with your feeding ministry. He said, my husband and I had lost our jobs. We were down and out. We just didn't know where our next meal was coming from. But said, through your guys' ministry, it gave us hope. It gave us food. And said, we now are on our feet. We both have jobs and a home to live in. So these are things that really go beyond transcend food. Um, you know, when people can come in and, and be able to, you know, have someone to talk to and share their burdens with, uh, that we can be there for them. So it's very important. Um, I hope that you'll, you know, our, our feeding ministry is on Monday nights, um, and we have several teams. We have some people that's been doing it. Uh, I know my, our team has been at it for over six years, but we have some people that's going to be, uh, you know, moving on. Uh, from that ministry and so we're looking for a few people to try to build some more teams out of so I hope that you will um, think about that pray about it and you can uh, got questions I'll be out here at the table uh, on your way out I'll be happy to answer any of those that I can so thank you very much thanks Monty very much God bless you brother I just wanted to say that I thought that went off in the previous service on the dance (laughs) very good little inside baseball there. Um, at the first service, uh, when I was going to just about to share the punchline about the Christmas tradition story, and I said, I'm going to blow your mind with this. And Monty just confessed, his phone went, <laughs> ding, like that. And it was perfect timing. Everybody roared. And I said, light bulb. <laughs> it was funny. That was you. All right. So we are sharing uh, with you about feeding ministry because, as Monty said, we do have an opportunity. Uh, We have uh, various teams. There's uh, a team every Monday night of the month. Um, And if this is something that um, appeals to you, is kind of in your skill set, it is a beautiful ministry. And as I think about our feeding ministry, it is one of those places here at LPC where we can directly um, love our neighbors, We can directly love our neighbors through the gift of hospitality and food. And that opens, as you heard, all these all of these other doors. Uh, and so if, you, um, if that's something that could fit into your life, uh, Monty, Inga will be available on their sign-ups today. Um, before I pray for our offering, uh, I wanted just to give you two more updates on things that we are, uh, have been called to. Uh, you will remember that two weeks ago, uh, we took a special love offering for Hope Valley or Valley Hope Church, which is an EPC church in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Through your generosity, um, I, I am blown away to tell you that we sent $10,000 to Valley Hope Church. Um, and we are now in direct touch with Pastor Anthony there, and he says this, quote, your donation has made a tremendous impact. You have changed lives as your support has made it possible for us to provide nightly meals, water to sustain our neighbors, mental health services, and a wide number of other forms of support. We are immensely grateful to look around and see the ways our neighbors' immediate needs have been met through such abundant generosity. Church, thank you for your giving, for your generosity uh, in the wake of such a disaster. Also, that same week, we asked you to uh, kind of spur of the moment uh, to bring in bottled water, and we were able to take uh, two, uh, the equivalent of two, over two pickup beds filled with cases of bottled water, and we also uh, got uh, a word back from that. Uh, they were delivered directly to Lower Shell Creek Christian Church in Rowan Mountain, Tennessee, which is three minutes from the North Carolina border. Uh, And then the person who delivered it says, the church had an incredible operation with about 100 volunteers and rooms full of organized goods. The water from your congregation was loaded onto pickup trucks and taken to the small community of Poga, Tennessee, uh, which was uh, hard hit, uh, and they needed uh, bottled water, drinking water. So again, thank you. Uh, You know, the Lord moves us in all kinds of ways to give in all kinds of ways, sometimes monetarily, sometimes items, sometimes our, uh, our, our very selves. And so thank you, LPC, for the ways uh, that you give. God has been so generous to us, and we get to be generous uh, to love our neighbors as a result of that. Uh, Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, you have been generous with us in Christ Jesus. And Lord, that's reflected in the generosity that we practice so that others may find rest and help and peace. Father, may we be vigilant to look for those ways to love our neighbors and to stand in the gap for others. In the name of Christ, in his name we pray, amen. Please stand as we finish our hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast. Before we head out on this beautiful day, we have just a couple of announcements for you. Um, the first is our annual candy hunt is happening this coming Saturday. We are so excited for candy hunt. Yes, we are excited for candy hunt, Terry. Um, if you will remember, this is probably one of the biggest outreach events we do for our community. Um, we had last year over 300 kids come through with their families. Um, and so we would love your help. Um, and that can look like either volunteering to help serve in a room, donating candy, we would love that. Um, or um, if you would like to just invite your neighbors, that is a way to help, to be here and present and um, invite your neighbors, invite your families. We are so excited that Saturday, starting at four o'clock um, here. And then all of you have this handy dandy uh, worship guide, correct? Did you know that if you open it up on the inside, there's this QR code here. Do you know what this QR code leads you to? The announcements. Isn't that great? So we have like um, a plethora of mission opportunities currently in ways to serve that um, I, I do not have enough time to tell you all about it, but you can read all about it in our announcements on this QR code. So please take your time to do that. Also, there will be people at the information table um, to help you out if you have any questions. Thank you, Pastor. Just blew my mind. This is a posture of uh, relinquishing to God what we want to hold on to, letting him take it, and also to receive what he might want to place in our hands. And so, if you're so led, uh, hear these good words. As you go from this place, go with the knowledge that you are never alone, but that Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and our Savior, he is with you. He's behind you to, to encourage you, He's beside you to befriend you. He's within you to strengthen you. He's above you to watch over you. And he is always before you to show you the way. So stay close to him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all the saints of God declare, amen. Go in peace, friends.